This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor. And I am joined by my co host, Joshua Ryan Rusin, the community director of Jake and Gino. Josh, how are you doing this fine morning? Gino, doing well, man. Doing some reflecting. It's it's wild to think that to the month four years ago, moved out here and started my journey with you guys. It, it seems, you know, honestly, like I've known you forever, but honestly, I, it doesn't feel like it's been four years. The time has flown. So, just reflecting on that. What, what's going on in your world? Well, God sent you at a perfect time in my life because I was moving that weekend and I was moving across the street. I purchased the house across the street, and Josh comes over and goes, "Can I help you with the moving?" I'm like, I, I got it, bro. And my wife is like, maybe you should ask him to help you to move. And Josh was there the whole day picking stuff up. And, and it really helped us out that day. And I'll never forget that day. It was a great day. It was a great time. And I think the community has exploded since Josh has joined. We've made you know lifelong friendships and relationships through the community. We've impacted the students over 35,000 units closed. And it's just been a really, I guess, a great culture building. It's been a great, great thing to see. I, I've been, I've, been blessed to be part of it and you know the student we have on today discussing his deals i think is a testimony to what you know josh has helped build here at jake and gino love it speaking of today's guest it's wyatt simon he's a self-described washed up basketball player turned investor who joined jake and gino in october of 2021 wyatt is a full-time investor with a current portfolio of 78 units and another 28 units under contract and having a goal of 170 plus units by the end of this year Without further ado, welcome, Mr. Simon. Hey, thank you for having me, guys. I'm excited to be on. Yeah, so why, one thing that's left out of there is you're 27 years old. So I want to kind of talk about, and you've created success in a corporate career, obviously now full-time, but I want to talk about your journey, your into your career, how you picked up in real estate, why you scaled up in a multifamily. Yeah, well, I, I was very blessed uh, to work for some investors right out of college. So real estate was something that was drilled into me at a young age, uh, worked for one of the largest home buying companies in Colorado. Uh, that allowed me to see how investors run numbers and how people actually do things. And so at that point, you know, I had no money. I had uh, nothing besides I just need to take action and, and get educated. Uh, and so that started everything. And then it just rolled into single families and eventually rolled into more education with Jake and Gino and then into multifamilies. So you guys built a pretty incredible thing here. So why, what were the challenges or stuck points you had before joining the community? The limited education. So, you know, you can only learn so fast when you're doing it on your own. And I, I did have a couple multifamily deals before I joined Jake and Gino. Um, but you know, you can only learn so much through podcasts and through free education without coaching, without mentorship and without well-packaged education. So mm -hmm. that was one thing that really sped up my, uh, my learning curve when it came to the multifamily side of things. And let me ask you about limiting beliefs. Did you have a limiting belief about getting into multifamily early on? Was it a pie in the sky for you? Or was it like one of those things I'm going to eventually end up doing? Yeah, it was a, a pie in the sky. Maybe, uh, Something, a good story I can share is uh, I was working a corporate job and my corporate job was foundation sales. I ended up uh, going on a sales appointment for a multifamily owner and it was your perfect mom and pop. I mean, this guy was smoking, blowing in my face, cussing up a storm, blue collar. His parents had built the properties and he had just managed it for 40 years. And I told him, I was like, hey, do you ever want to sell these? And, and he said, yes, I really want to F and sell these, everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at that time I was, I had maybe three single family homes and had no idea how to run multifamily numbers, but I just said, Hey, I work with investors, you know, send me over the financials and let's see what we can do. And, uh, he, he sent me over everything and I had no idea how to run these numbers. I had no idea how to underwrite. And, and he was asking $2.1 million for this complex. And I, you know, that was a pie in the sky to me. And then three weeks went by without me doing anything. He starts calling me, Wyatt, can you sell? Are you going to buy this? Wyatt, are you going to buy this? And I just didn't take action. I, I didn't know what to do. Uh, it was a huge pie in the sky. I was 24 at the time. And, uh, and eventually he ended up, I, I just called him back and I said, hey, I don't know what to do here. And, and you should probably just talk to a broker. And he said, it's too late. I already talked to a broker. We're listing at $2.8 million dollars. And, and I'm sure he got, and it actually went for more than that. So uh, I missed out on a, on a 
great deal because I didn't know. And, uh, and that made me say, okay, now I know I need to take ed- I need to ad- educate in order to take advantage of opportunities that come in the future here. I could go so many different directions now, but f- for me, now that you joined the community, you were still working a W2 job and doing real estate. How are you doing? How are you balancing and juggling both at the same time? Yeah. Um, I don't have any kids, so that helps. I have two cats. <laughs> Um, but I mean, it's just about making it happen and it's just about prioritizing. I'd say, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, you're doing the same thing when you're cooking in the kitchen, doing deals. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, when you're, when you have that downtime in between tasks at your job, you're on the phone, you're making it happen. Um, and then every morning prioritizing, you know, your time, how can I, how can I do what I need to do today? Mm-hmm. And what prompted you to leave your, your W2 job? Cause you just left recently, correct? Correct. Yep. So in December of 2021, I uh, officially quit corporate. And uh, yes. Um, and what prompted me to do that, truthfully, is, is we had a single family home buying company uh, that we took zero profits out. We ran it for a year and a half and took zero profits out of it uh, for a year and a half. And so my partner and I said, OK, we can take zero profits out of this. Then we can have a runway to then go full time into things. And so that that was our safety net. And now, you know, that company, we've, we've purchased 15 homes this year already from, from that company alone. So that takes discipline, Wyatt, to be able to do that, have those flips, that profits in there. Talk about that because most people would take that and upgrade their lifestyle. I mean, especially at our age being young. Yeah, I, I still live in a duplex. So I'm, I'm still house hacking at my age. Uh, I think, you know, delayed gratification is one of the things that people don't don't necessarily do in American culture, but uh, it's one thing that Ray Dalio preaches on. And, and if you can set yourself up like that, then I know you, you get to be in the better spots to take advantage of more things in the future. And as far as discipline goes, you know, it's not easy, but if you have your goals and you have your goals written down, then you have a clear pathway for where you want to go. And every day, you know, I'm reviewing that and getting better. What made you want to leave your W2 job? I hated corporate. It just, you know, it, I was very micromanaged, you know, I was the I was one of the best sales guys and to have a manager just breathing down my neck all the time was, uh, was disappointing. And then I also just felt like I wasn't reaching down my, my, my potential. You know, I was, I was, my time was someone else's for eight hours of the day. Um, and I couldn't do what I love to do, which is real estate. Mm-hmm. We haven't touched upon your spouse. How, how has your spouse really helped you on this journey? Because it's just not, you're not on an island right now. You've got a partner, Sean, who's helped, who's been there also. How has your spouse helped you out on this journey? Yeah, she's been incredibly supportive. And, um, and, and so she sees what we're doing and, and she fully believes in it. So it's, it's so nice having someone who's equally yoked with you. Uh, and she helps out in our property management business as well. So she's kind of the office admin. She, she helps with a lot of marketing and creative stuff. Uh, she's got an eye for the flips. So uh, unlike me, I'm boring. I'm, <laughs> I'm plain Jane, but she gets to, to do all the fun uh, fixtures and finishes and whatnot. I love that. I, I need to make one one thing that I've just noticed that as you've been speaking, that first deal that you lost on a few years ago, there was no clarity there. I think as you've gotten older, you become more clear on what you want. And I think this is just for all the listeners to take note of. If you have no clarity, you won't be able to focus on something. We need to be able to focus on something. Why it says, hey, I'm living in a duplex because he's got a reason why he's living in a duplex because he needs to reinvest the capital into these, into these projects. And whenever you create equity in your life, that's when you start getting rich. It's not just about transactions. He's got his transactional business with a single family home. That's paying the bills. That's getting his money for the multifamilies, right? And from there, you transfer one to the other. So I think everybody who's listening to this right now, what are you clear on? You know, what is your primary question? What are you focused on right now? That's important because what you focus on grows. And if you're focusing on making money, but going out and buying liabilities, nothing wrong with that. That's just going to grow in your life. And if you continue to do that for the next two, three, four, five years, those actions will continue to multiply. But if you say to yourself, I'm going to commit the next three to four years to living within my means, which is, you know, okay, I'm going to reinvest whatever capital that I have made and continue to do that. Life will be a lot different three to four to five years from now. I mean, you want to comment on that? Why? Because it seems as if that's what you've done the last couple of years. And now you're here. It didn't just 
wake up one day and say, hey, I'm quitting my W-2 job. You gave yourself a nice long runway. It didn't happen. Proper planning prevents poor performance. And it just, you don't wake up one day and say, I hate my job. I'm going to quit tomorrow. You can be methodical about it. You don't have to burn the bridges you know, and the ships, whatever you want to say. You didn't do that. You were methodical about it. I did the same thing as you. I bought my first deal with Jake. Three years later, I left my, my restaurant. It took time to do that. It took planning and persistence. Uh, can you just, I, I guess, expand upon that for us? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Gino. So maybe a good story that I'll describe that is, um, you know, I was, I'm young, I'm still young, but, you know, three years ago, I was Friday nights were fun nights, right? Stay out late, have fun. Um, and then once we started our, our single family home buying business, every Saturday morning for the last two and a half years, I have met Saturday morning, eight o'clock at the coffee shop. And we have we have always done a deep dive on our business. So we have weekly meetings Saturday mornings. So doing that has made me not want to go out Friday nights because it really sucks when I do that. So, you know, that little habit right there has just autopiloted people, yeah, autopiloted our business because a lot of people use the weekends to get away from their life. Uh, but what we did is we started using Saturday mornings and the weekend to plan the future of our life and to autopilot that. And that has been instrumental in our life. So figure out what's important is what I'm hearing. If what's important in your life is to go out, have fun and party, nothing wrong with that. But don't expect to live in a life where you can actually decide on who you want to work with, where you want to work with, and why you want to work with. And there's one other thing that I need to really clarify here. Just because Wyatt's 27 years old, he's young, he has no kids, don't make that as an excuse. I had five kids and I had six child when I decided to leave my restaurant and go into real estate full time. So that's an excuse that we make for ourselves. We don't have enough capital. We don't have enough time. We have a big family of big expenses. Those are all excuses. It may take me a little bit longer to do that than what Wyatt did, but I can still have the same results that Wyatt did. So let's not leave those excuses. Those are what we call limiting beliefs. So let's not let that hold us back. Now, Wyatt, when you joined we talked about buy right, manage right, and finance right. I think you've gotten more out of the manage right than the buy and the finance. Can you expand upon, upon that a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. So last year, you know, we, had, we purchased 48 total units and we were using a third-party par property manager. Well, we, we used one, we fired one because they were not doing well. Mm -hmm. We then uh, ended up uh, hiring another one and then I started to go to Jake and Gino. And Jake and Gino you guys, you know, obviously you guys preached all about manage, right? So how to track KPIs, what KPIs to track, what your manager should be doing, how you should be interacting with them. And uh, I didn't know any of that. You know, I just figured give it to them and let them do it. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they weren't doing a good job. And so eventually fired the third, the second property manager and just said, all right, I'm going to take this in house and I'm going to build a, an elite property management company because I don't think anybody will manage your assets like you want them to. And obviously you guys have already done that and you guys are the, the gold standard in the industry. So uh, we have now done that. And uh, I'm really, really proud of our team. We've been really focused on economic occupancy and every month we've grown uh, in, in economic occupancy since taking over the portfolio. Do you think you'd have been able to do that without being part of a mentorship group? And not just specifically Jake and Gino, but even having that idea of saying, hey, I can bring this in house. Hey, I can call up my coach, Jen Allen, big shout out to Jen and, and, and pick her brain on what's going on. Would it, have been, would it have even been a thought in your mind to do that? I did consider uh, taking property management in house. And we actually almost did when we initially purchased our, our 23 unit, mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't because of just time. Uh, and so we, my wife and I were both working full-time jobs. We just said, I don't think we can, we can reasonably do that. Mm -hmm. So the thought was there, but would the KPIs be there? No. Would the, would the, you know, the piloting that we need to know to be there, the education piece wasn't there. It was just a, an action piece and action without education is not always the best. I love that. So you have the property management company. Now you have the investment company you have the multifamily you have the single family. So you've got a really nice little multifaceted multifamily, which is really all feeding itself. Would you, you know, would you like to comment on that? Cause I, I see that you have a small piece of that going, but as you're adding more deals and expanding the property management company probably helped you get out of your W2 as well because it's probably giving you a little bit of income. It's not really that, that as much of an income generator, everybody who's listening. Really what it does, it drives NOI and it drives occupancy and it drives profitability as well. And it drives that customer experience. So there's one component to it. Uh, you know, if you want to discuss all your different levels, that'd be great. Yeah, so we have the single family home purchasing company, which we, we keep majority of these. We just use the Burr strategy and we keep them with no money. Uh, the next thing that we have is we have 
I have a property management business, so we manage our entire portfolio, and that does help with a little bit of income, but the majority of it, like you said, is for full control. And so my goal is to be the best operator in Omaha, and in order for that to happen, I know that I need to have vertically integration so that I can actually control uh, the manage right piece of things, because that is one of the most important things. And then the last thing that we're building right now is deal flow, so that that is a deal flow with brokers, and that's also direct to seller. And so our single family home buying company, we have direct to seller. We all do off market deals, and I think those are the best deals. So now we're building the off market deal finding for multifamily to then do the same exact thing. I love that. Can we just dive into what your buyer criteria is? Let's go into this deal that you've got under contract right now. What are you looking for in deals right now? Yeah, so we're looking for value add component. Um, right now we have a 26 unit under contract built in 2003. Um, they're three bedroom, two bathroom with a garage townhomes, uh, really, really nice units. And it's in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and, and so the, this, this is a crazy story, but the, the, the sellers actually won the lottery 11 years ago. Uh, they they were factory workers that won the Powerball, And, uh, and so they typical mom and pop, they manage it and they just didn't, they don't see the increase in rents that, Obviously there is. So we're looking for anything we can just take over, either increase rents or do some kind of value add and then refi out. Wow. So this deal, they're, they're managing it themselves. They've owned it for how long have they owned it for? Uh, they've owned it for, I think, six years now. Wow. And as far as value add, is that what your strategy is? Basically, you're a value add investor trying to raise rents, trying to do, you know, as far as uh, efficiencies with expenses. Can you dive into that a little bit? Yep. So we're, we're a value add investor that likes holding things for the long term. Mm -hmm. So I've only ever sold one asset in my entire life um, of doing anything. Uh, but what we look for is anything that's under market, we can increase the rents, uh, anything that doesn't have ancillary income. So if, for instance, this property, uh, the owner's paying for water and sewer. And so we'll implement rubs and, and, and we'll also implement some other fees and we're expecting over 20 grand a year in ancillary income. Uh, in addition to the rent bumps that we're already uh, seeing. What is the idea behind not wanting to sell anything? Yeah, I think uh, I just like to hold assets and, and become wealthy. Uh, I think that's the, the best way to do things. I don't have large expenses, so I'm very comfortable to be, uh, you know, not have a ton of cash sitting in my bank account, but rather have a lot of assets that are making money every, every month as the, the ticker goes. Uh, because mm -hmm. then I don't have to be in the rat race. I've, I saw the meme on online the other day, and I think that's true. You know, rich people sell, wealthy people hold. And I think there's a component to doing both. If you understand the conveyor belt theory and when you can sell, at certain points, you may have an older asset that may become functionally obsolescent. You've held it and the market's high. Well, maybe it's time to sell that asset. But as Wyatt does, you're not going out and buying a Lambo. You're going out and buying another apartment complex with that money. That's the important distinction between someone who's wealthy and someone who's rich. You're selling for a strategic purpose. You may want to see, hey, I'm, I like the build rent model. I'm going to put money into newer assets. And that's what happens when we start out, everybody. You may start out buying an asset that's older. Our first deal, we still own it. But I could have seen of selling it a couple of years ago. It's an older asset, cottages, a six-unit efficiency motel. We just bought that asset so well that there's no reason to sell it. We don't need to re repurpose that money, but that's what you're doing. You're trying, you're leveling up. You may have a four unit or an eight unit and saying all of a sudden, Hey, I want to get into a 50 unit complex. Let me sell these smaller assets and repurpose it into a bigger deal. It's all about getting those deals on the conveyor belt, letting them work for you. And then if you have the opportunities to scale up and to buy a bigger deal, I think that's something that, um, you know, wealthy people would consider it to sell. As far as the rich people, they're just looking for transactions and looking for that next rip. And what happens with that next rip is you get that rip and you don't put that money back into a deal. So it's really, really important. Kudos to you. Let me ask you, how does it feel like right now? You're working full time in real estate. The W2 grind is gone and now you're in a different grind, but it's, it's your grind. How does that feel? Oh, it's, it's so awesome. I was just talking to my wife about that last night, actually. We, we love, love, love being able to just you know, now we're creating, it's like, it's like the world is a canvas that we get to create. Now we get to do anything we want with our time and we get to do it as much or as little as we want. And I'd say I'm probably working harder, if not the same, if not harder now, uh, but I get to do what I love. And, and it's really fun seeing, you know, if we sit down quarter one rocks are accomplishing. I just posted them on Facebook. So it's, it's, it's so freeing and it's, it's awesome. Well, the irony is that you're only 27 years old. You quote unquote retired 
from your W-2 job. And most people think of retirement as sitting at the beach or going around doing nothing. But those of us who retire young, we don't think that way. Retirement to us is not sitting on a beach and hanging out. Retirement is working when we want, which is probably more, with whoever we want, wherever we want, and why. There's a big why to be doing what we're doing. So to you, what does retirement look like into your head? Expand on that a little bit more for me. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I just got back from Chicago on a, on a little friend's trip and I I lost my, I about lost my mind if I go for more than a day without working. So uh, yeah, there's, you know, there's a, there's a component to it of just, you know, when you have a purpose, you, you want to accomplish that purpose. And so, um, you know, when you're on vacation, it's great for a certain amount of time, but it, yeah, I, I, I have a, a ticker that just wants to keep working because I feel like we're meant to work, right? We're mm-hmm. meant to, to do things for other people. And I love bettering our community in Omaha, you know, one asset at a time. And we provide great homes for people. And so mm-hmm. that's, you know, what we love to do and why we do it. This may be a challenging question to answer, but how did you find your purpose? And how would you tell the people listening to this? How do, how do I find my purpose? There are people out there that are rudderless that don't know. It's taking me years to find my purpose. How, how did you find your purpose? Yeah, that, that is a great question. Uh, one of the books that really helped me find my purpose was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and by Stephen Covey, which I know you're a huge fan of. Um, mm. it, you know, in that chat, in, in, you know, begin with the end in mind. Uh, it, it says to just go through a funeral and that funeral is your funeral. So picture that in your head. And I did that uh, four years ago, you know, and I wrote it down and I, I, you know, what do people, what do you want people saying about you? How do you want this to construe? What do you want to do with your life? And when you start with that in mind, then I think that's how you formulate your purpose on what you want. And then from there, it's just a, again, it's a blank canvas and your life is the sum of your actions that you choose. So what I want everyone who's listening right now, if you're driving, you can't do this, obviously, but just close your eyes and think about what it will sound like, what it will look like at your funeral. You know, what do you hear? Who do you see there? What do you smell? Are people laughing? Is anybody even there? Are they happy? Where's your family? Are your kids there? This is all really important, everybody. This is the crux of what life's all about. If you can't picture what you want your life to look like at the end of it, how are you going to be able to create values for yourself? How are you going to be able to ask yourself, should I do this deal? Or should I invest with this partner? Or should I go on vacation with my family? Or should I just forget about, you know, dealing with the kids and I'm just going to work on my work on my business or work on my job or whatever? Or, or should I leave my W-2 job? You can't answer those questions in the short term because you don't have a long-term picture. So everyone needs to sit down after they listen to this and really focus on that and then create what we call values-based decision-making. Because from that picture, you can reverse engineer all of those goals that you want. I mean, quickly for me, I wanted to create the Jake and Gino community because I wanted to impact a lot of people's lives. I want a lot of my students to be there at my funeral. I want my wife, the six kids, hopefully 20, 22, 23 grandkids there all saying, you know, it was really cool. He's got a great trust. The wife doesn't have to worry about money for the rest of her life. That money is going to go to my kids and it's going to go to my kids' kids. So I've already thought about my estate planning. How does that look? These are all things that are impacting you. That's why proper planning is so important in every step of your life. And it's going to change why and Josh, these things do change as you get old and you grow. But if we're not thinking about that and pondering it, and all we're doing is doing, 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 and we're not sharpening the saw, as Stephen Covey says, and we're not doing first things first, and we're not you know, applying all those seven habits, then we're not going to be living a fully impactful life and we're going to be rudderless. So for everybody out there, figure out what your purpose is. And we all have different purposes in life and we will mature and our purposes will change in life. 10 years ago, my purpose wasn't, isn't what it is now. I've grown into somebody, I think bigger and better, a version of myself. And I think why you're going to do the same thing. If I talk to you 10 years from now, you're probably going to have 3000 units on the contract, on the management. You're probably going to have different businesses. You're probably going to have two or three kids, hopefully, and your, your, your goals will be different. That picture will change. You have to continue to revisit that picture and continue to fix and focus on what your, now I guess what your goals and what your values are. What do you see yourself in the next three to five years? Yeah. Amen to that, Gino. Um, yeah. In the next three to five years, we're going to be uh, scaling up our multifamily portfolio here in the Omaha market um, and just continue to do value add for, uh, you know, partners and investors throughout this and, Really, the goal is to get everything set up on 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 autopilot. So we're piloting the business, and then if you see behind me, I'm originally from Colorado, and uh, the goal is to get back to Colorado and raise a family 
at some point, but we want to set up the businesses so that they're all run operating efficiently. And then we can live wherever we want to and pilot them from, from that area. I love that last long answer question. If I'm out there and I'm doing single family homes or I'm in corporate and I'm considering multifamily, what should I do? What are my next steps to get into multifamily real estate? education plus action. So mm -hmm. what action are you taking and how are you getting educated? Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not for me, but I've lived it and you have to be educated and you have to take action. And there's plenty of people doing action. I was an action guy. You know, I, I take action pretty easily. I go, 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 but then, you know, and, and there's a lot of people that take education. All they do is educate and then they never do anything. So mm -hmm. you have to pair those two. I'd say you need to find a coach uh, and, and you need to find, and then you need to figure out how to take action. And some, some of that's, you know, talking to your family, getting things set up, getting your purpose and then go. I, I love that. Everybody knowledge is, is not power. Knowledge is just something that you can grab out there. If you're not taking consistent action with the knowledge that you've assumed and you've, you've learned, it's pretty much useless. I love that tip. Let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsors. Gino, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know that you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who want to follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. All right, why? Well, I got some short answer questions for you here. What's your favorite book and why? Oh, I touched on that earlier, but Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, man. That, that book is, I got the Bible and then I got that book. Those are the two the two books. Mm -hmm. Boom. That. Love it, man. What about biggest habit for success? Biggest habit for success is, is daily writing down and just piloting my day. Uh, and that, that goes off of, okay, I have yearly goals that I want to accomplish. I have quarterly goals. I have monthly goals. I have weekly goals and then the daily. So what do I have to do every day to do that and incorporating that in your morning routine to then go crush it? Yeah. Listen, why I love that, man. And I, I just want to say you're in a very inspiring person and really a big takeaway from this episode is, is show me how you spend your time and I'll tell you what's really important to you. And you live that of having your actions align with those goals, right? Most people just talk about it, but they don't want to be about it. And it comes down to action. Do you know what, what other, you know, what, give, give us a summary of the episode or takeaways. Josh, I love what you just said. It's it's really important where you spend your time it is really focuses on what you want to um, accomplish in life. Are you spending time on TV? Are you on Twitter? Are you on Facebook? If that's what you're focusing on, ultimately, that's going to grow. And what's really cool about it is everyone out there listening, most of you might say, that's just too much discipline. That's too much hard work. You, you're really planning. It's taking so much out of fun. But when you read all these books like Atomic Habits and all these goal setting books, it in the beginning, like any other habit, it's painful. But all Wyatt has to do is, what am I doing today? Today's Monday. Oh, I've got to read for 30 minutes. I've got to do this property tour. I've got to be putting these two offers. He doesn't have to think about it because it's already planned out. And that's what you want, everybody. You want exactly. I've got my books all over the place today. So I still got to do a little opera singing today. I still got to do a little bit of reading. I got to go out and play tennis with my daughter. I got to run. So I've got those things written down. And if you plan your day, you don't have to think about it. It becomes automatic. It becomes a habit and it becomes a muscle. And then all of a sudden you do that one day then one week, then one month, then one year, then all of a sudden it becomes habitual and you're starting to take action without even knowing that you're doing it and it becomes habitual and it's not hard. It doesn't become hard anymore. I think Josh, the other thing is just becoming clear on your goals. I mean, just because you started out single family home and you start doing that and you say to yourself, well, I want to become wealthy. I think Wyatt went out there and saw what wealthy people are doing. He wants to mirror what they're doing. How do you set up a business? He's already thinking about going back to Colorado. Well, how do I set up a business here and be able to set this up and not, you know, as they say, half-ass and then just leave. He's setting up the systems right now and doing all the hard work on the front end so he can enjoy life on the back end, Josh. Love that. Wyatt, listen, how can the listeners get a hold of you? Yeah, feel free to reach out. My Instagram is Wyatt Buys Houses. 
Uh, you can also add me on Facebook. Uh, and then soon our website is being completed. Uh, so you can book a call through our website. That website is fcequitypartners.com. FC stands for full circle real estate, which is what we do. So fcequitypartners.com. Love it, man. Well, listen, I want to thank you for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing your story. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a movers and shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks, Wyatt. Yeah, thank you, guys.